Okay, you can start. So, okay, so uh, welcome guys to another session from the hands-on machine learning with our uh, book. And today we're going to be talking about chapter six, uh, regularized regression. Uh, before we begin, I posted in the chat uh, something that corresponds to uh, our previous session that when we discuss logistic regression and their assumptions, and I found this in another book club from the Introduction to Statistical Learning. And this is an addendum where uh, clearly uh, I list the logistic regression assumptions. What are the assumptions uh, compared to uh, the ordinary uh, linear regression? Mm -hmm. So it's something to you know keep, uh, uh, keep tabs on, OK? Mm -hmm. So let's begin. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, what are we going to be uh, uh, learning or discussing today? Uh, the first topic, and I'm just following the, the main sections of the, of the book, is uh, why regularize? In other words, why do we have to use this technique? Then we're going to discuss some of the regular, regularization or penalty models. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking for the implementation. Also, there's a tuning that you have to do because there's going to be a parameter within that penalty that needs to be tuned for optimizing an, a cost function. Then um, we're going to be uh, doing some feature interpretation. Then we're going to go back because we're going to use all the examples on this section correspond to the AIMS uh, uh, data set that we're using, the, the, the sales in AIMS Iowa from, from, a, from, a, you know, from, a, from a range of years. And then we're going to be going back to the logistic regression example with the attrition data and how uh, we can apply also a regularization uh, method and some final thoughts, all right? So let's start. Uh, in the introduction, the author gave us a, a, you know, a summary of what we have been uh, discussing uh, before. So he says that linear models uh, provide a simple yet effective approach to predictive modeling. However, uh, in real world data sets, uh, typically we have a large number of features. Also those features could be uh, very highly correlated with, with each other. And uh, sometimes you can get more features than observations. And that is a big problem for this type of, of models, uh, referring to the ordinary uh, linear regression and also the logistic regression. So he says that as the number of features grow, uh, certain assumptions of both models uh, typically break down. All right, and then they tend to overfit and also then tend to be unstable uh, models. So here comes then the regularization. So the regularization, what it's trying to do is, is a means to constrain or regularize those estimated coefficients because that basically is the product of uh, an ordinary linear regression or a logistic regression. We're going to be trying to fit the best possible line or the best, you know, the, the least, uh, uh, the, the best accuracy in the logistic regression uh, with those estimated coefficients, all right? Okay, so why do we have to regularize? So the author uh, starts with the aims and we're going to create something that we have seen before. We're going to create an ordinary uh, linear regression model with the response variable, the target variable as sale price, and the predictor as the gross living area of the, of the housing unit. And here, what the, what the book illustrates is the best fitted line, right? From those observed values between the, the intersection between gross living area and sale price, which give us a scatter plot of the, of the observed values. And if you can appreciate those lines between the red dots and the blue line, that is the distance between the observed value and the predicted value. 
In other words, that is the residual, the, the errors. And what the ordinary linear regression is trying to do is trying to find the, the best fetal line in terms that it minimize, minimize those, uh, uh, that distance between the observed and the predictive value. In other words, trying to minimize the sum of the square errors. And that's the function that we have here. Okay. So we have seen this before in chapter, in chapter uh, uh, four, uh, I believe, Ch chapter four, linear regression. Okay. So here comes then uh, the regularization. And as we discussed, sometimes we get more features than observations, right? And that's a very, uh, in, in other words, the ordinary regression and the logistic regression, they're going to have problems uh, with, with this. Also, uh, presence of multicollinearity, right? That increases the, you know, the, the estimation of those coefficients. In other words, it inflates uh, those, uh, you know, uh, coefficients, uh, estimated coefficients. So a solution is to use what is called a penalized models or shrinked uh, methods. That could be another word you know, to describe it. And what we're going to do is that in that minimize equation, we're going to add a penalty, okay? And depending on the type of penalty is going to be the type of regularization that we're going to do. So in the book, the author discusses the three, you know, traditional methods uh, for regularization of uh, uh, ordinary regression or logistic regression model. The first one is the ridge, which is associated with what is called uh, L2 norm. The lasso uh, uh, regularization method, which is uh, associated with the L1 norm. And then the elastic net, I, I always call it, elastic net is the best of both worlds. That it combines the ridge and the lasso. And usually this is the model that you're going to be trying to tune, okay? Because you can tune not only the penalty, but also the ratio between ridge and lasso, all right? Um, any comments, any questions so far? Well, it's good. It's good? All right, okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's go. Uh, so let's start discussing the ridge. Okay, the ridge penalty, also called L2 uh, norm penalty, it has this type of penalty, okay, which is going to be a lambda, right? That's the uh, parameter that we're going to be uh, tuning. Then it's going to add, right? Uh, sorry. It's going to add the, you know, the, the beta, the coefficients. It's going to add it to the square of all the coefficients to this function. In other words, if it's going to add, I want to minimize, we need a lambda, right? That is going to be um, appropriate, right? To the objective function that we're trying to do. So the lambda is going to be the regulator in this case, because this is fixed, okay? When we, uh, you know, uh, do, let's say we do the lambda zero, that we do the minimize uh, uh, square, uh, you know, sum of square errors, uh, we, get this, we get the same um, uh, line that we did when we were doing without the regularization. So the lambda is going to be really the tuning parameter that is going to give us uh, the best fit with that penalty, okay? So uh, I said already that lambda, when lambda is zero, there's no effect and the objective function is equal to the ordinary linear regression, right? But as lambda goes to infinity, then the penalty becomes large and forces those coefficients towards zero, but not all the way. We're going to see that th this is a big difference with the lasso regression, okay? The rich penalty, uh, is going to try to get those coefficients, okay, those estimated coefficients that they are big, they're going to get a little bit smaller, okay? And they're going to be towards zero, but not all the way. In other words, they're going to be asymptotic, okay? Towards zero, but not reaching zero, right? So this is an example 
that the book uh, give us of uh, five uh, predictors uh, randomly, randomly uh, selected. And as you can see, as Lambda grows, right? We have one, we have 10, we have 100. This is a log scale. Uh, we see, for example, that X1, it starts with this uh, coefficient, then it grows, right? You know, uh, get, getting this uh, basically maximum uh, there, if you, if you put it in absolute terms. And then as Lambda grows, all the coefficients, they're going to start shrinking, okay? And that's a good thing because as the shrinker goes, then the model becomes more, more stable, right? The only, uh, you know, uh, presumption or even, even result that you have to be careful here is that the rich penalty doesn't, uh, uh, because the, 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 the predictors, the coefficients, they're not going to be, you know, reaching zero you are going to have all the predictors always, no matter what lambda you choose, okay? So in fact, you know, it doesn't uh, discard any predictors. Let's look at the lasso. The lasso, which is associated with the L1, instead of the square of the coefficients, this is going to be the absolute value. And that's basically the difference. It's the same function, except that the square is uh, replaced by an absolute value for those coefficients. So this small modification really has a uh, great impact because now, uh, instead of the rich penalty that we had before, now the lasso penalty is going to push those coefficients all the way to zero. In other words, if we have, let's say 100 coefficients, uh, 100 uh, predictors, and some of them are going to be, you know, uh, going to zero, in other words, we are discarding those predictors in the in the in the formula, right? The formula of the whole, you know, uh, uh, regression. So this model also, uh, you know, can be used, can be utilized for feature selection. Okay, and that's the main difference between the lasso and the ridge. The ridge is going to consider always going to consider all the predictors. The only thing that is going to push some of the predictors that are getting larger. Is going to push it to you know uh, zero, but it's going to, it's not ever going to reach zero. In the lasso, yes, they're going to reach zero, and they're going to be discarded. Okay. Uh, comments, questions so far? No. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, so here, uh, you know, when we saw this, right? When we saw this, we saw that all these predictors are tending towards zero, but they're not reaching zero. Here in the lasso, they're reaching zero. In other words, you know, the curves are more, uh, you know, kind of more steep instead of asymptotic, and they are reaching zero, okay? So in this model, uh, there were 15 variables, okay? Originally in the, in the, in the formula, then with, uh, with a lambda of 0.5, okay, nine variables were retained, and with a log lambda of equal to one, only five variables. So as lambda grows, and it's not going to grow the same way as the ridge. As you see, the ridge, uh, the numbers could be you know really large because of this of the square, but because we're using the absolute value, the lambda of the lasso usually is incrementally in terms of decimals, but those decimals are going to have a big effect. So if we do that incre increment, then we're going to see that uh, less and less predictors are going, to be, are going to be included in the final formula of the regression, all right? Okay. So I, uh, just the author you know, mentions that elastic nets is a combination, right? It's a combination of the ridge and the lasso. So you are going to have in the formula, you're going to have not only this parameter, but also uh, the rich parameter also. So we, we are going to have both, okay? If you, if you see in the book, let me show you in the book. Uh, okay, so we have two uh, uh, penalties now, okay? And, okay, and the advantage of course of this uh, model is that it enables effective regularization via 
uh, rich penalty with the feature selection characteristics of the lasso penalty. You know, that's what I call it, the best of both worlds, right? You know, we have the rich, we have the lasso, and we can have a more robust uh, model after, you know, tuning this, uh, you know, these two parameters. Remember, you are going to tune the lambda, and also you are going to tune in the list elastic nets, you are going to uh, tune also the proportion. You know, how much we're going to get from the rich and how much we're going to get from the lasso to minimize some objective function. Okay, so in the implementation, the author uses the GLM net package, which is the same package also that is used in the in the tidy models. Okay, the new uh, the, the new um, a machine learning uh, uh, framework. Okay, but uh, let's stick with the you know base R here and use the GLM net as you know intended. So here we're going to create, we already have the, our training a database aim strain, right? So we're going to create a matrix, right? Because th that's the input that the GM learner is going to be working, a model matrix, and it's also it's more efficient. We're going to create a matrix of the, you know, of, of the uh, sale, of the formula, which is sales, uh, explained by all the predictors included in that data set. Then the Y, is, which is going to be the response, is going to be, uh, we're going to transform it to a log. Why? Because that uh, particular variable is very skewed, okay? It has like a right uh, skewed uh, uh, tail uh, there. So with the log, we get a little more, you know, uh, uh, Gaussian, Gaussian shape. And that's why the author is using the transformation. Then to run the rich, uh, a model, okay, because the GLNet includes both models. Uh, the parameter that activates one or the other model is called alpha, okay? And this alpha parameter, when alpha is zero, is going to perform a rich, uh, you know, uh, uh, regression, rich penalty regression. For lasso, the alpha is going to be one, okay? So anything in between, zero and one is going to be then an elastic net. So we have all three models there within that alpha parameter. But now we are going to uh, uh, activate the alpha equals zero, we're going to activate only the rich you know, uh, component, okay? So we have our predictors uh, x, right? We have our response variable y, and then this is the plot, okay? And as we can see, we have a total of 299 uh, predictors because remember some of them are categorical factors and then going to be converted, you know, uh, they're going to be dummy, uh, uh, dummy encoded and they're going to be, you know, adding more, uh, more variables, okay, to the equation. And R does it, you know, does it uh, under the hood. So we're going to have 299, but in the rich, remember that those, those predictors, the total is not going to change, okay? What we're trying to do is, uh, you know, interpreting this plot, what we're trying to do is trying to get the larger uh, uh, coefficients, get them, you know, lower. In other words, in magnitude. So they don't, you know, they, they don't uh, uh, put the, uh, you know, get, get the, the formula unstable. Get the result, on, you know, unstable and overfitting. So, uh, the lambda that is applied to the penalty parameter, okay, we have here, and it's going to be a sequence of lambdas that the model is going to be applying, right? I, I believe the default in this model, in the GNN med, the default is one hundred. That you know, is there's going to be a space of one hundred different values of lambda, right? And then it's going to be applying until, uh, until we get, and we have to tune this, you know, we can get a, a minimization of an objective function. And we're going to, do, we're going to do that next. Right now, we're just applying this, you know, this model and visualizing what is the effect on all the predictors as lambda grows, all right? So, uh, the small lambda results in large coefficients, right? So if we apply the coefficient uh, function to the ridge 
and we select some of the predictors, and in this case, latitude and overall uh, quality, uh, quality very excellent, okay, from the 100. You will see the latitude is the one that has, you know, the the the, the large uh, uh, coefficient, and then overall has the smallest one. Okay, when lambda, uh, the large lambda results, which is this one, this is the lambda here. Okay, instead of one hundred, we're going to be doing one, checking one. Then that number, the latitude, is going to be also very small. Okay, um, let me see, okay, uh, okay, uh, ju just, you know, just a clarification here. This is not the lambda, okay, I, I, I said something wrong here. This is, you know, the 100 uh, rows that this matrix has, okay? So the first one is going to be, you know, the lambda that the, mod, that the function chose, you know, as the starting point, which is going to be kind of a large lambda, and then it's going to go, you know, uh, increasing that lambda. Okay. Yeah, because these are these are the lambda models. These are the lambda numbers. Okay, so they go, they start large. Okay, and then they start decreasing. So the first one is going to correspond to this one, two hundred eighty-five, right? And then the 100 is going to be where we have to do a tail here to see which is the last lambda that the model used, which is going to be small. So it starts from large uh, to a small uh, lambda, all right? Mm -hmm. And we can see the effect of the estimated coefficients of the predictors uh, for a small lambda, which is the last one, and a big lambda, which is the first one, okay? And as you can see in the first one, uh, the shrinkage is noticeable, right? Uh, we have latitude here in the last one, which is the smallest lambda of 0.6. And here we have a coefficient of 6.11 to the uh, negative 36 power. Okay, so uh, the shrinkage is really uh, noticeable. But remember, this model doesn't discard any. Okay, it uses always, it uses all the predictors. All right. All right. So let's go for the tuning. So remember that the uh, lambda is a tuning parameter. In other words, is the is the is the uh, parameter that we can change, right? Uh, depending on how you know how what, what kind of multicollinearity you have in the model and how many predictors also you, do you. Have. Okay, and the, the goal is to control model for overfitting the training data. So to tune the optimal uh, lambda, we're going to use the same, right? The same function, but instead of GLM net, we're going to do a cross validation. So to do a cross validation, this function, you just have to add CV dot before the GLM net, okay? Also, we are going to apply a lasso uh, regression to the same, you know, to the same uh, uh, parameters on predictors and response, but instead of alpha zero, it's going to be now alpha one. So we can compare both models, all right? Okay, so the function that we are minimizing here is the mean square error, okay? But it could be other functions. It could be root mean square error, uh, you know, uh, mean average error, et cetera. But this is the default. Uh, a function that GLM has. So as you can see, this is the region, okay? Maybe Kianto, Quant, uh, you can uh, help me here. Uh, if you can just draw a, a, like a circle here. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Okay, so this is basically the region where we have minimized that mean square error. So these values of lambda, right? Or log of the log of lambda from minus two to zero, they're going to be the optimum, right? Okay. Then compared to the lasso, okay? The lambda parameter is going to be right here, okay? Between these two dotted lines, okay? And the model, you know, will give you, you know, what, what is the minimum? 
uh, 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 number for that lambda. For example, for the rich model, the minimum is 0 0.01748, okay, with a lambda of 0 0.02. This is the this is the mean square error with a lambda of, of 0.10513. Where in the lasso, which the mean square error is 0 0.01754, it produces a lambda of 0 0.00249, okay? So maybe the question that you have in your mind is, well, which lambda are we going to use, right? Okay, so let's see how, you know, how, how, how this works. So the minimum uh, CVM, right? The minimum uh, mean square error for this model Okay, this is this is from the book. Okay, uh, I don't know that you know uh, that uh, there was a change. You know, when we went to our version four, uh, there was a change in the random number uh, generator function. Okay, so anything in the version in the R version before uh, version four has a different formula for getting those random numbers. And then after the, the 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 version four, okay. So we have a you know kind of a, a before and after here. So that's why even using the same seeds, we're going to get a, a little different uh, numbers here, okay. So uh, when running this, the minimum uh, minimum square error uh, that I got was 0 0.0219, okay. So this uh, had to be revised here, okay. And the lambda, the minimum lambda for the ridge is going to be 0.389 instead of 0 0.0513. Okay. Then uh, doing the what is called the one minus SE rule, right? Uh, we're going to see which of the ridge of the lambda, okay, equals to this, this number, one SC. And then try to find out from the ridge uh, which which is the one that corresponds to this one, okay? And that one is going to be 0 0.02512028, okay? With a lambda of 0 0.6757165, right? Then we do the same for the lasso, okay? And we get this number, okay? For the for the lasso, we get this number 0 0.02 Six five three eight eight seven. So we can see that both the ridge and lasso penalties provide similar MSCs. However, these plots illustrate that ridge is still using two hundred ninety four features. Okay, remember the the ridge re regression. Uh, it doesn't do any discarding of the predictors. It's always is going to use the same predictors along you know the lambda you know spectrum. However. For the, the lasso, okay, the final model, uh, the author tell us, right, that the model only uses 64 features, okay? So although the lasso doesn't offer significant improvement over the rich model, in other words, they are basically, you know, in the same, you know, in, in, in the same uh, level, according to the MSE, uh, we get approximately the same accuracy by using 64 features. So the question is, do you prefer a model that has 64 features, you know, for the for your final model or a model that has 294 features? What do you think? Less features. Less features, right? Okay. It's going to be more efficient, you know, computer are efficient and also it's going to be a more stable model and that's one of the goals that we want to, you know, we want to achieve. Okay, so uh, running again the, the same models, okay, and plotting, uh, you know, the, the 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 shrinkage of these models, okay, uh, we can see right, you know, again the the dotted lines that we got here, right, that we are here, you know, that the the optimum, uh, uh, you know, range of the of the MSC. And what is happening to coefficients? And as you can see in the ridge, we still have the same numbers. But here in the lasso, we get a shrinkage, okay, on the number of predictors. And that's where we get that number of 64, because this is the range, okay, 
that we get the number of predictors. And that model that minimizes the, uh, the MSC with the, with the corresponding lambda, that gives us around 64 features, okay? Questions so far? So remember, in this case, the rich and the lasso, they're not agree on the lambda. They agree, they're agreeing more on the MSC, the cost function. The lambda is quite different from the rich and from the lasso because you know they're different penalty formulas, right? But one advantage that the lasso has that the rich doesn't have is that it you know reduces the number of features. And that is an additional bonus for that model that really you know helps in the you know in in, in getting that final uh, model with less you know uh, predictors okay so in and other words you have a question uh, yeah go ahead. no 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 i no i think that and and you have a question because he, he yeah, tried sure. to... yeah um, the in your formula you are having uh -huh. a line what does represent the blue line? Uh, yeah, the the blue, blue line comes from here, okay? So let me see, okay? This is going to be kind of a, that, like the upper, you know, uh, in interval, right? The upper interval yeah. and the lower interval, okay? But they come here. As you can see, you know, they are yeah, the same, line, okay? For the, you know, for the, for the log lambda, okay? So what they're doing is that they are getting this dotted lines, okay, from this graph, and then applying it to this graph that gives you the shrinkage of the coefficients. In the rich, because they're not going to be, you know, never, they're going to be zero, they're going to be shrinking that uh, uh, number of, uh, of, of, the, of the parameter for the, for the predictor, the estimated coefficients. In the lasso, apart from shrinking, they're going to be discarding those predictors. So you see that the model, uh, you, we have 286 uh, features. Now here in the lower end, we have around 160, 150, 55 something. And here in the blue, we have almost 60 there, okay? So the author is saying that, you know, there, there is some sweet point here that it will give you, you know, the best MSC with, 64 features, okay? Yeah, this is the optimal range that comes, okay, that comes from this, you know, graph, all right? Yeah, yeah what, one, thing, one thing that we could add, you know, uh, you know, looking at this graph is, you know, try to add those values, right? <laughs> okay, which, which it, it will be uh, more informative. You know, add these values of lambda and also of the, you know, of the of, of the number of predictors that we have. In the rich, it doesn't matter. It's going to be the same, okay. But here, uh, you know, it would be better if we had that that uh, you know information of uh, uh, the log lambda that we are intersecting here with this vertical line, those vertical lines, and also the number of features. Something that you know we could add, you know, like later. Then, is that is that answer your question? Uh, I... Yeah, because to me it was really strange the name one SD. Uh, the name of the upper uh, upper value. Okay. Yeah, uh, you, you, have... you mean you mean this value log lambda? No, in the formula, in you say Abernine. Uh, lasso, ah, oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. This is the the, the AB line is the the vertical line. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean the 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 name of the value that you are exporting from the lasso object. It right. have a name one. S I want to see. Yeah. Yeah. What well, I want to see that's a parameter that is already calculated. You know, with the ridge and lasso formulas. Okay, which follows this rule. Okay, the one minus SE rule. All right. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a real be, you know, it's not obvious that it's the upper value. The, that's the okay. Point. Well, just to confirm. Thanks. Right. Okay. 
but you know ju just make sh make sure that you understand that this dotted lines come from from this plot okay because it's the same values the log lambda is the same values here as here okay we're good okay so let's let's continue okay so uh, so far we have implemented a pure ridge and a pure loss in other words we have not combined them right okay so now we're going to combine them so we're going to again do the lasso and we're going to do you know we are going to add two elastic nets okay with alpha 0 0.25 okay which is is going to be a mix of ridge and a lasso elastic 2 is going to be 0.75 okay so you know what how inter how, how you can interpret that is that because it start from zero right the the ridge start from zero as you add, you know, you increase that value, uh, you know, uh, in, in decimals, right? Here, what you're adding to the ridge is 25% of lasso, okay? So it's going to be 75% of ridge, 25% of lasso. Then when you go to 0.75, you are reversing those. So now lasso is going to be 0.75 and ridge is going to be 0.25 in that mix, all right? Okay, so this is the result, right? Okay, this is lasso, and we have seen this already, you know, in our previous slide. This is the ridge, and we have seen this in our previous slides, and then we have our two new models from the last net. Okay, 0.25 and 0.75. Okay, so uh, to get the optimal, because now, because we combine those uh, models, now we can get an optimal alpha and an optimal lambda. In other words, we're going to tune both of them. So the uh, the equation uh, here, the function is going to be trained, right, from the carrot package. We're going to train these uh, predictors with this response. The method is going to be GLMnet, okay? We're going to have a pre-processing uh, step for a zero value. Uh, predictors, in other words, predictors that are constant are going to be discarded before running the model. And we're going to do the center and the scale. In other words, we're going to normalize the numeric predictors. Then we're going to do a method of CV, right? Cross validation with the number of false 10 and the tune length, okay? The number of parameters that we're going to use for both alpha and lambda, they're going to be 10. It's going to be a grid of 10, okay? And the, and the train, this trend control is going to choose chooses for it for for us all right so when we run this we get that the best tune with the lowest rmse now it's rmse not mse right because we're doing the train it's a different function uh is the seventh uh you know fold which a lambda of 0.1 okay which reminds us of the ridge right the ridge had a 0.12 and then the the lambda is going to be 0 0.02 okay which you know a couple of numbers here so if we uh plot this right plot the cv german net which is the uh which is the the result right the 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 tuning result from this uh you know uh tuning train function uh we're going to see you know the effect of the mix right of the mix from zero to one from the ridge to the lasso and then adding the lasso component and then the rmse uh, function that did, that's the one that we're trying to minimize and we're going to see that this is the line basically this is the line that is going to have the uh optimum uh parameters okay uh, any questions so far No, we're good. We're good. Okay. So here, what we did was combine those, uh, you know, those penalties, right? The ridge and the lasso, and now we can get, 
one optimal alpha and one optimal lambda. Because if we run the models different, we're going to get different, you know, different uh, lambdas. Okay. So uh, use an alpha of one, right? And a lambda of two. Those are the you know optimum parameters that we have that is going to minimize this RMSE. So how do we compare our previous best model? Okay, the one that we have with the with the lasso, right? With the 64 features. Uh, with this one, the elastic net. Keep in mind, the author says, keep in mind that for this chapter, we log transform. So we have to inverse that transformation with the exponential function for the predictors and also the uh, observed values. So here uh, we have the prediction, right? From this uh, cross validation GLN net, which is the elastic net, uh, a result. And then the RMSE. Okay, it's going to be, uh, there are going to be two parameters, the predictions and the actual uh, uh, values. So the prediction is going to be uh, expo exp exponentially, right, to remove that log. And then we're going to apply also the exponential to the y's, okay, to the response. And this is uh, the result, okay. In the book, we compare it with the PLS, the partial least regressions, which is, was apparently was the best model that we can get with the RMSC of 25,460. But here, the regression, the, 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 sorry, the regularization methods, the optimal methods give us an RMSC of 23,281.59, uh, which is much better, right? Than the, than the previous uh, best model that we had uh, before. All right, so it makes sense to uh, to regularize at least in this uh, in, in this case. All right. Okay, so let's see. We have yeah, we have time. Okay, so what about feature interpretation? Right, the variable importance for these regularized models. Well, we can get uh, this variable importance with this function from the from that same package VIP variable importance. Uh, and we're going to do it with elastic net, the one that we had, uh, you know, the best, mo the best uh, model that we had. We want to have the, the, uh, the optimum, you know, the, the, one, the, 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 the 20 features that the model mostly use, you know, for, for this. And this is the result. In other words, gross living area is the one that has the highest. Uh, importance because probably has in these models, it has the highest magnitude of the coefficient. Then we go to overall quality excellence, first floor, garage cars, your build, good, and so forth. Okay, so these are the 20 most important uh, predictors for our, for our model. All right. Okay, so uh, it says also that similar to linear and logistic regression, we can explore the relationship between features and response, okay? So the way that the, the, the author uh, does it is with this function, uh, PDP, partial dependent plots, uh, partial, okay? And this is the formula uh, with the ggplot, this is the formula, you know, to get those partial. So we get some information here about what is the, you know, the behavior of, uh, the gross living area compared to the white hat, to the, to the predicted values, right? Okay, and as you can see, it's, it's linear, right? Because it's a, it's a numeric uh, uh, feature. Also here, first floor, also linear. Garage cars, also linear. And then overall quality excellent, that's the, you know, the outlier, right? It's, maybe it's not that linear, <laughs> that linear, because it's a factor. But you can see that there's a difference. Okay, and this is important because this is what it makes it a good predictor, that there's a difference between when quality excellence is not there and when quality excellence is present in the overall quality, that, that indicator, all right? Um, let me see here, okay. Uh, if we go, instead of over quality, over, overall quality, if we, if we go to the X, instead of the excellent, we go to the quality poor, uh, we should see the opposite, right? So in other words, when it's not present, that indicator that the overall quality is poor, then the price should go up, right? 
And when it's present, it should go down. And that's what this you know, uh, little graph, little plot uh, is showing us, okay? So it's consistent with our uh, expectations that the overall quality, if it's excellent, is going to increase the price of the unit and when it is poor, it's going to decrease it, okay? Okay, so one more, one more thing, like the people from Apple, you know, uh, like to say. So how about if we apply this regularization methods to a logistic regression, what would happen? So this is the, you know, the, the, the script uh, for this. Uh, we call it the attrition, right? And we mutate anything that is ordered to factor so that the model can, you know, ingest it. Uh, we're going to split our data set into train and, and test set. Then we're going to train using caret. We're going to train the attrition with all the components. Remember, the attrition is a factor. Okay, it's, it's not a numeric uh, uh, response. It's a factor. In other words, if the employee leave or the employee stay, uh, the data is going to be the train uh, uh, data set. The method is LGM. The family is binomial. We're going to do the same pre-processing, and for the method, we're going to do the CV with ten folds. Then we are going to run this, which is the the tuning, right? Okay. Uh, the same the same process that we did with the aims. We're going to tune the alpha, right? The mixture between uh, rich and lasso, and also the the lambda. Okay. And this is what we get. So for the logistic model without without any regularization. These, these are the, uh, you know, the, the range, the range of values for the accuracy, okay? Remember, we're not talking about numeric, we're talking about classification. So now we have the metrics are going to change and we're using accuracy as our objective function. So the minimum in this model is going to be 0.8 accuracy and the maximum, depending on the faults, right? Is going to be 90, 0.93. For the regularized model, we have a minimum of 0.83 and 0.92, but check the median and check the mean. There's an increase, right, in terms of the accuracy from the original model without penalization and the penalized model. Okay, how statistically, uh, you know, significant is that's something that we have to find out. Okay, because uh, I try to run the t-test uh, function uh, for this, you know, for these two vectors. Okay, these two vectors, and there's one problem is that you know there's not enough observations to you know get a uh, you know get get that function you know uh, uh, a result. Okay, it gives me an error. So uh, we can do also a visualization, you know, kind of a box plot. A visualization and see you know if there's a you know if we can notice a difference but the but the best uh the best approach would be to do a, a you know a, an hypothesis test to see if these medians or means are significantly different with this distribution okay and that's something that uh we have to do for the you know for for the next uh, next step all right any questions so far no, nothing. Good. Yeah, All correct. Right. Good. All right. So, final thoughts. Okay. So, the regularized regression uh, models uh, provide uh, many great benefits, right? It provides for uh, a response for the multicollinearity, right? A response for uh, the feature selection, okay, that we can shrink not only the magnitude of the coefficients, but also the number of predictors. And that's always good. Also provides an option for handling when more observations, you know, when we have more features than observations, okay? And that's something that we can, you know, deal with the lasso, you know, with the lasso uh, model uh, uh, regularizations, okay? 
and it also has fewer hyperparameters. There's only basically with elastic net, there's only two. Okay, the lambda, which is the penalty uh, coefficient, and also the mixture. How much ridge, how much lasso, you know, we, should we get to get an optimal model? So it's easy to, to tune. And it's very computational and memory efficient. Uh, when I ran, you know, these models, uh, they took less, at least in, in my computer, it took less, less than a minute. Okay. So final comments, final questions. Oh, oh that's, that's great. Yeah, that's very okay. good explanation. Yeah. So, good, good. Yeah, it's great. So. Okay, so but, now we are we are almost experts in globalization. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but okay. yeah, the uh, thing is, ahead, a, yeah, but the thing is, in the example used in the book, it actually says actually it does not show any kind of a great improvement compared right. to the yeah GLM or logistic regressions. But the right. thing is, maybe maybe there is a, something we can do, maybe if there is a, another data set we can use, or maybe those might uh -huh. be the kind of a dramatic kind of things, maybe we can see that why this one is very important kind of thing. Actually, in this uh -huh. case, because uh, one of the, maybe in a classification problem in this case, because uh, in the data set used in the book is a kind of a quite balanced kind of classification, but Right. The things in my in my in the data set that I used before is a kind of a data set classic uh, the item like a class the category the balance mm -hmm. of the category is a highly highly unbalanced so that means some mm -hmm. of the some of the category has the very few observations compared to the the right. other yeah in that case maybe we can use the these regularization approaches to to control for the debt, debt balancing issues. So, mm -hmm. cause, uh, right. cause you know, cause uh, when, whenever we, we have a survey data set and then uh, our outcome is the categorical variable, maybe in that case, if there is a case that uh, one of the, one of the, our category or uh, one of our category has a very few observation, which means each, each response excessively represents to the population. Mm -hmm. In that case, we can try to use, apply to the regularization regression to control the balance issues. So, mm -hmm. but in this case, the, the data set used in this book is actually, the classification is quite balanced. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so that's the thing. We also, don't have any kind of uh, improvement for this, but yeah. Yeah. Also, I could add that you know usually accuracy is not the best you know uh, metric uh, for classification. There are others, and we have seen it. For example, uh, Kappa is yeah. one of them that yeah, combines right. all the elements that you see in the confusion matrix because the accuracy yeah. we only see in the diagonal, right? The true negatives, yeah. true positives. But we are missing if we are hitting the mm -hmm. false positives and false negatives. So the yeah. kappa or even the F1 score, okay, could be a better metric to get sense of you know the overall uh, performance of the model. And maybe there, okay, we have to, you know, we have to see you know how we can run that. But maybe there, then we can see a difference. Okay, if the regularization is impacting those false negatives and false positives. Okay. Yeah. Or maybe we can use the MAE to compare, compare the logistic and parallelized model, and then we just uh, try to compare the these kind of uh, uh, errors that happens yeah. to the prediction. Yeah. Like uh, when we try to try to apply to the test the data set and then uh, get the this MAE value and then uh, compare it, maybe mm -hmm. we can see there is any kind of improvement between right. the Logistic and parallelized model. So, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, I think that this is it. So, I would say maybe. Okay. I'll one more thing. One, one more thing. If you want to know a little bit more about about this, about rich and versus uh, versus lasso regression, I recommend this uh, 
uh, this video, okay? Mm -hmm. It's from StackQuest with uh, Josh Stammer. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a very, uh, you know, uh, down to earth uh, explanation mm -hmm. of the, mm -hmm. you know, of the difference between Ridge and Lasso with visualizations. So let me put it there. Okay, so it stays in the line. Okay, and I'll try to include that video in the in the notes. Okay, uh, it has it has another video for Elastic also for Elastic Net when you combine the ridge and the lasso, you know, in, in one model. Okay. okay. Yeah. Great. So, so this. So 